I'm Eli Cairo from Olympia Provisions. I'm gonna show you how to cut and serve every type of charcuterie. The word charcuterie means cooked flesh in its origin, and it is the way to preserve meats. Let's get into our first category, dry cured meats. The most simple but yet difficult of all of the charcuterie techniques. It is salted and very simply flavored, usually with no spice whatsoever. <laughs> This is an Italian ham from Parma in Emilio Reggiano. The prosciutto is cured bone in back leg of the pigs. What you're looking for at a prosciutto when it is sliced is that it is evenly cured, meaning that it has a nice even color of pink through it and the fat is pure white. The Italians, they're very, very proud of this product. They say there's only four ingredients that go into prosciutto de Parma. That is Italian pork, Italian sea salt, air, and thyme. The most classic pairing is prosciutto and melon. However, I like to serve it with whatever fruit that is in season at the time. Grab the prosciutto, very simply fold it over, drape it over your piece of fruit, drizzle it with a little bit of olive oil, because why not, and enjoy it. Mm. It's almost like the Italian peanut butter and jelly. You get this amazing melon or fruit flavor, and then you have the salty, fatty extra layer behind it. It just makes it unbelievable. Copa is one of the most sought after cuts on the entire pig for a charcuterie maker. This is the neck of the pig. It is the only cut on the entire hog that is naturally 30% fat. That is the magic fat to lean ratio that charcuterie makers use. Copa is usually dry cured, so it's relatively hard. It'd be very tricky to cut this with a knife. I have a slicer here. If you have a slicer at home, I'll show you how to do that, but at whatever store you buy it out, they will be able to slice it for you. To start off, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you remove the casing from the outside. When you're getting this sliced at the deli, just ask them to slice it slightly thinner than a quarter. They'll understand. You could do the old classic, you know, that, they'll get you. Ooh, that's what you're looking for. A nice full piece that's holding together. It's not separating. That's kind of the perfect slice of copa. I feel like I'm working back at the deli. Boom, let's roll. When plating, I like to start in the middle. I take my first piece, probably at 12 o'clock there, and I fold it over. Then the second piece, right to the left of it, pull it over, and continue that all the way around, rotating the plate as you go. And then you do two or three more in the middle, and you have yourself the most classic traditional plate of Copa, right back to Italy. Copa is one of those products that I like to make a simple cheese fruit plate with. A Robiola cheese is from Piedmont. With a good bloomy rind cheese, the molds on the outside are to be consumed. Take a piece of the copa, a piece of the cheese on top of it. You could either have some cherries on top like that or some just to snack on on the side. And then you take a piece of the honeycomb, kind of drizzle a little bit of the honey all over it. Life is good. Mm. Yeah, it honestly takes you away. This is spend, you know, an hour with your friends, family, enjoying, eating, repeating, talking about how good honeycomb is. Think about cherries, copa, repeat. This is literally, in my own humble opinion, like the apex of cured meat. These come from an ancient pig that is raised in the Iberican Peninsula. It's such a piece of art in my mind. Most pork is raised in confinement or on a farm. These pigs, the second it gets weaned, is away from its mother, is left out into a pasture, into a forest. It's eating grasses, herbs, and most famously, it is foraging for acorns and chestnuts. It creates a one-of-a-kind flavor that we haven't been able to replicate. The outside of it folds its own little micro world of beautiful grays and blue molds that actually preserves it, allows it to dry evenly, and imparts an amazing flavor inside of it. The specific knife we have here is a carving knife for the Homona beer. It's very, very thin, super sharp. It also has these grooves in it, so the ham will slide over it and not get stuck onto the knife. In cutting, a hamon iberico it in itself is an art. I am by no means an expert at this, but I sure do love doing it. Just nice long strokes, keeping the blade of the knife flat onto the ham so it doesn't gouge into it. And you can see there we're getting a little bit of fat, staying paper thin and removing it. 
And this is something you do not have to do at home. In Spain, there's people that this is their profession, they're actual experts at carving plates and they can do it extremely quickly. And with such a valuable piece of meat like this, I wouldn't necessarily try this at home, kids. With something as special as this product, I like to serve absolutely nothing with it. Don't screw up perfection. Oh my God, it's unbelievable. What is very, very traditional is a really salty almond with it. But yeah, don't put anything on this. It doesn't need it. Don't get fancy with it. Just serve it and enjoy it because it's amazing. Deli meats, also known as lunch meats or cold cuts, are already cooked, so you can eat them right off of the slicer. Salami koto translates into cooked salami, not cured salami, so that is why it is in the deli selections. This comes from the shoulder and fat back from the pig. I like to slice it thin. You're gonna wanna remove the casing. Make a little cut, then just rip it off. When you're looking at a salami koto, you wanna see fat dispersed throughout it with good separation from the lean meat. On this one too, we're seeing big chunks of black pepper, which means you're gonna get nice black pepper bites in the middle of it. This one, we slice a little bit thicker than a coin. And then very simply, we lay them flat across the bottom. This is amazing by itself. It goes unbelievable on a pizza. It is an absolute essential ingredient on a grinder sandwich. But this is the way I like to serve it at my house with a salad on top. It's super easy. Grab really fresh, delicious arugula, spread it over the top of it. Casiofrano olives, crush the olives and the seed will pop right out, sprinkle it around. And then real easy with lemon on top, drizzle with olive oil, and of course, crunchy salt over the top of it. Mm. Salami Koto is so herbaceous, has all the big black peppercorns, all the amazing flavors of herb. And then arugula has that really amazing peppery crunchiness to it. And then you get these little bursts of uh, lemon in there. It's just a super simple salad. <laughs> Some say the king of all sausages. It is one of the most difficult deli meats or even difficult cured meats to make consistent and perfect every single time. It is really, really tricky because you're making a full emulsification. An emulsification is when you take lean meat and you make it into a paste and then you fold in fat. It's essentially the same process I always say as making mayonnaise. It has sweet spices, cinnamon, cloves, a little bit of nutmeg, I speckle it with fatback, pistachios, and whole black peppercorns. To dice it, remove the casing. I like to do it in uh, about half inch, nice little chunk. Try to slice it straight. Boy, that's beautiful. Then just cross cut it, and then just cut it into nice little squares. We're gonna slice a few too. This is a meat that you would like to slice a little bit on the thicker side because it has all these amazing textures in it. Little folds here and there. We'll take the diced mortadella, we'll place that right in the middle there. For this, I like to use an extra sharp Parmesan and I like to use a potato pillar to get chunky slices and then simply parsley leaves spread across the top just for a little bit of parsley bright flavor. There we go. Between a bite of pistachios and a little bit of the Parmesan that has hard texture. It's so simple, but yet so flavorful and it's kind of mind boggling. <laughs> Some people may call it a Taylor ham. Its origins comes from Trenton, New Jersey. In this pork roll, we have pork, fat, tons of salt, brown sugar, maple. It's also fermented, so it's tangy, and it's seasoned just with white pepper. So you're going to remove the casing. I love fermented and smoked meats because it, it, you know, it, it, in a weird way, it instantly reminds me to step it into an old deli. So you cut it into eighth of an inch, nice rounds. You want to cut a few slots down the side. I like to use a little bit of oil and a little bit of butter because health. This should roughly take just two minutes on each side. Traditionally, it is served on a hard roll. So I butter up both sides. Got to have a cup of coffee because it's breakfast. We're going to put one layer of folded American cheese. Right now, you can add your bread, toast it up. Put that on top of your uh, bread. Go ahead and add your eggs. It's gonna be a real quick scramble. Cover that right onto the top of it. Put your lid on top. There you have it. An egg and cheese pork roll sandwich, a classic. Mm. Yeah. 
you're definitely coming back to that deli. You just can't screw with that flavor. You think of charcuterie, you don't necessarily think of a sandwich. But the pork roll is such a classic meat for a breakfast sandwich, we had to do this. This is a shelf-stable meat, meaning it doesn't need any refrigeration whatsoever. But instead of using plastic, I like to dip it in wax to keep all of the oxygen out of it. So it'll last, in theory, forever. Its origins are from Europe. The farmers would make this out of their pigs in the wintertime, ferment it, and then they would be able to consume it in the summertime. This sausage is made from trim and fatback. The way I remove the wax, if you get one that is in wax, is just chop off the end, chop them into rounds, or cut it down the side, and then go ahead and just peel the wax off of the casing just like that, and then cut in two rounds. Summer sausage to me is one of the most nostalgic cured meats in the entire world. It tastes sour, it's smoky, and it has usually a mustard seed or a chili flake in it. I like to pair this just really classic and simple, saltines, dill pickle, delicious cheddar, and obviously a nice pint of beer. Uh, mm -hmm. Some pickles. Oh yeah. Oh my God, that is so good. Don't screw with the classics, people. I'm gonna go finish this beer. You guys can just hang out. Pepperettes or smoked pepperoni sticks. You think of the ones that you'd go into a gas station and buy right off the counter. Very classic American style deli meat, if you will. This is not something that really you need to prep. This is already ready to go. You grab them, you take them out of the package, you shove them into the mouth, you eat them, you chew them, you enjoy it, life is great. That is why they go so well with say these types of cheeses. Baby Bell, for example. Perfect. When you bite into it, you can tell that it has fresh spices in it. This one has caraway, black pepper, a little chili flake, all of which goes really good with a mild fatty cheese. Salami is a ground sausage that is fermented and dry cured. Salami is shelf stable, but it does need refrigeration to keep it in perfect form. Here we have Salami Etna. This product here has been made in Sicily underneath uh, the volcano of Etna for centuries. In Sicily, they are very famous for their citrus, their pistachios, and their sea salt. And so if you take this product, it is everything you would find on the island of Sicily to make a beautiful, unique salami. Salami is leg meat of the pig or the ham and 100% of the fat back. What you see on the outside here is live active mold. Mold is super important in quality salamis because it gives it its flavor. So these are natural casings. They are double sewn casings and it is also in a net. You're gonna remove the net, you're gonna see the these mold spores come off of it. That is live mold. You want to slice these really thin because it is hard. Kind of droops over itself. That's about where I like my salami. I like to keep it very simple. I love the flavor of a dried or fresh fig when it has that beautiful sweet roundness but isn't too dominant in the flavor because the salami etna really is subtly seasoned. And then take a bite of the fig. Yeah, that's awesome. A good quality salami, it should instantly start melting and then a bite of the fruity fig just kind of like cleans the palate up so you can return back to it and enjoy it. Mm, that was good. Here we have saucisson de Arles. Like other salamis, this is made with pork leg and fat back. Saucisson de Arles is a French style salami. It is one of my favorite salamis ever made because it's only seasoned with pork and sea salt and mold. They're so proud of their pigs in this region of France that they protected that if you make a salami from this region, you're not allowed to cover the flavor of the pork with any other spices. I use a knife, no need for a slicer on this. Cut it at a bias, roughly the thickness of a quarter. This mold has a little bit more of a yellow. Throughout the year, you'll see variation in the molds. That is kind of the beauty of live living salami made with active molds. Mm. One of my favorite ways to use the sausage is to have it side by side with the Bloomy Rind cheese. You use the tip of your knife and you're removing the top of the cheese. Then you take about a teaspoon of garlic, about a teaspoon of white wine. I'm gonna put it in the oven at 350 degrees for about 15 minutes. Yeah, this is all gooey and delicious as you can see. At this point, I like to slice a little bit of apple with it. Give it a beautiful stir with your salami. Oh my God. 
you're tasting amazing pork and you get this warm melty cheese that has the slightest note of spruce and a piney flavor to it. And the moldiness and the funkiness of this cheese really goes so amazing with this. It's a pairing of just true unique flavors that you would only get in live active products. Mm. And do ya. It's spreadable because as you make it, you take the trim parts of a pig, belly meat, shoulder, and then you add up to 60% fat to this product. So after it ferments and dries and it's hardened, and there's so much fat in this that it still stays spreadable. When you say andouille, the origins of it are Spanish. Now the casing from this is not edible. Just cut off the chunk that you're going to use and then you can place this back in your refrigerator. Slice the casing down the long way and then go ahead and remove the entire casing. Andouille has a million different ways to use it. You can throw it into a pan and do mussels. It melts really well. You can bake it onto flat breads, but it's also just unbelievable by itself spread on bread. Grab a little bit of butter. We're doing the darn thing. Grab a little bit of your andouille, spread it across. Oh my gosh. Or it's seasoned with spice and has an amazing pork flavor to it. And it is fermented, so it has a little bit of tang on the outside of it. It would be essentially a chorizo butter. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Chorizo Andalusia from Andalusia, Spain. This is a dry fermented chorizo. There are, I would say, thousands of different types of dry cured chorizos in Spain and Portugal. This one has smoked paprika, sweet paprika, a little bit of garlic and clove in it. Chorizo, as opposed to other salamis, it usually uses shoulder meat and other fats besides fat back. It's important to know if you have a natural casing on the outside or if you have live mold. This one you can tell is a natural casing so you can consume it. Cut the tip off and then slightly slice it at a bias, roughly the thickness of a quarter. Here we have some olives, we have some manchego, we have some peppers and we have our favorite oil cured anchovies. We're gonna take chorizo andalusia, piece of manchego right through the middle of it. We're gonna wrap a oil cured anchovy onto it and then an olive, and that'll be your first variation of it. And for the next one, we'll do a more of a classic one, chorizo, mild but crunchy pickled peppers, and then the anchovy on top of it. Mm. This amazing salty fishiness in the end of it. I could eat so many of those, it's unbelievable. Mm. Rosette de Oregon. This is the salami that I produce that I am the most proud of. This salami kind of represents everything that I've been trying to do in the meat industry since I've started. All of the pork that I use in this is from a network of farmers that have every one of their pigs out on pasture. That's the model that's actually gonna be sustainable for us to carry on making pork the right way in America. I like to cut it on a bias, take off the tip, See, it has this really dark color from it. Part of that is the wine, but part of it is also that these pigs spend their entire life out in the field moving around. It gives it a higher muscle density and changes the color of the meat as well. This blue cheese from Rogue River down south, it's 100% organic. The salami, place a little blue cheese on the cracker. Blue cheese and hazelnut, heaven. The first thing you notice about this salami is the mouthfeel. It's very slightly subtle with juniper and rosemary. This blue cheese has like a bright pop of mold and crazy flavors. Hazelnuts are one of my favorite nuts to eat with fatty salamis and cheese because the tannins kind of clean your palate and allow you to eat more. These cooked smoked meats, they're more moist and they will have other flavorings in them, spices, smoke, and other seasonings. Here we have capicola. This is a roasted meat, salted, with a little bit of seasoning, black pepper and chili flake into it. This is the neck of the pig. It is one of the most sought after pieces of the entire pig for a charcuterie maker. It is so brilliant because it actually has naturally 30% fat in it. This is one of the pieces of meat you should slice with a slicer. You want this roughly the thickness, no larger than a quarter, right roughly the size. It should hold together. Once you got the sliced meat, like to kind of show off the patterns of it if possible. I really enjoy this with the crunch of onions. And then I love capers and olive oil for this. A little extra olive oil because as we said, we're enjoying life. And then pecorino, this is sheep's cheese. I like to take my potato pillar and then just get little rounds all over it. That naturally makes it the right texture. You know, it's not too thick, it'll melt. To eat it, make sure you get some onion, caper, and cheese. Roll it all together. Mm. So 
so good. It has a depth of flavor to it. It's just not just pork and salt. With this, you have a little coriander notes, black pepper, and a little bit of chili flake for heat. It's very balanced, shouldn't be over dominating, and it shouldn't be too salty. Sweetheart ham. This is a sirloin tip ham. And this is the top of the leg where it meets with the pork loin. It's called a sweetheart ham because in the South, initially where this name came from, it was just enough ham for you and your sweetheart. We like to use apple wood and a little bit of hickory to smoke it. The apple wood gives it a really amazing buttery texture. It is an amazing ham because it is so diverse. You can slice it into big steaks, griddle it for breakfast. It makes the greatest breakfast ham. You can slice it thin, use it on a sandwich. It is also just delicious enough to make a ham plate. I like to serve it on a baguette. This is non-salted butter, a little crunchy salt on top. Just one little pickle, because I'm that kind of guy, just a little crunch on there. And that is not going to suck. Mm. Mm. The ham, when you taste it, the first thing you get is this amazing moisture and texture. You have a lot of beautiful aromatics that are subtle in there. And then of course, the very faint, but beautiful smoke that's on there. And it absolutely goes perfect with the butter and the bread and the crunchy pickle. You have to try this. We'll make a ton. We have a ton of these. Please try this. You guys need to try this. Landraukschinken means country, land, rauch, smoke, schinken, ham. Country, smoked, ham. This is my personal favorite smoked meat of all time. In America, we sometimes call it a Schwarzwalder ham or a Westphalia ham. It comes from Switzerland originally. This version of it, which is also very traditional, is the entire loin of the pig. This one smokes with apple wood and a little bit of hickory for about 18 hours. If you get a whole chunk like that, you need to check to see if it still has a skin on. Um, you would take a knife and cut it, just slice very thinly. Definitely keep this and you would add it to your beans or anything else. You can slice this with a knife, but I recommend getting it sliced at a deli. I like to grab the skin side, very similar, and fold it over, make nice little just ribbons with it. It is a very, very rich piece of meat. I like to serve this with a crunchy, delicious salad. My favorite is remoulade, and it goes amazing with this, and that is thinly sliced celery root. Gruyere cheese, also from Switzerland. I like to almost do equal parts cheese to celery. Healthy amount of chives, a little bit of creme fraiche, good amount of salt, and then a dollop of mustard. You mix this together, place it right on top, grab your Gruyere and celery mustard, make a little roll. Oh my God. Mm, that was my type of salad. The meat by itself is an amazing flavor, a beautiful smoke, and you have that caramel on the outside of it. It has a little bit of rosemary, black pepper, and juniper on it that just adds like a little background hint. It's like a flavor roller coaster. Gruyere is a very mild cheese. It lets the meat flavor shine. I like the salad on it as just a little bright, crunchy side note to it. Confit is considered the oldest form of charcuterie. It is a simple process of seasoning meat, slowly cooking it in its own fat to preserve it, then covering it with more fat to keep oxygen away from it. This duck confit is made from duck legs. You add salt, shallots, parsley, and spices, usually white pepper, black pepper, a little bit of cinnamon, and clove. This is fully cooked. I'm gonna show you how to crisp it up and eat it warm. Heat a pan on medium heat. You're gonna take a good amount of your duck fat into your pan. Once your fat is nice and warm, you're gonna take your duck leg and you're gonna place it skin side down into the pan and give it a nice little press into it. It'll slowly render and turn into a crispy cracker on your warm comfy. I like to pour the warm duck fat on the other side as well. As those are crisping up, I'll start my salad. This is frise, a wonderful chicory. I take raw shallot, a squeeze of lemon, a pinch of salt, and a drizzle of olive oil. Mix that up. Now that they're nice and browned, flip it over. They should be crunchy, which they are. Just gonna let it warm up just a second on the other side as well. Once I feel like it's warm, I'll remove it to my cutting board, pull it apart, get it off the bone. All you have to do is add that into your salad. 
perfectly fat, moistened, crunchy duck confit. Mm. My favorite thing is when you get a warm piece of crunchy duck skin on top of the lettuce. It's like the best crouton you've ever had in a salad for sure. Duck riette. I know this may look like pudding right now, but that right on top is actually the duck fat. Duck riette is the confit legs pulled off of the bone, hand chopped, and then the duck fat folded back into the chopped meat placed in the ramekin, and then covered with the layer of fat to preserve it. It's considered to be one of the first butters in the whole world. Originally, we would use this to moisten bread in the same ways that we would butter. When you serve duck riette, I like to take it out of the refrigerator for about an hour before you use it to allow it to get to room temp. Spread it on top of your toast. I'm gonna put a little bit of cherry jelly, a little smear, crunchy flaky sea salt, and that's it. Mm, that is so delicious. The duck confit has a natural gamey richness to it and a little bit of the sweet cherry kind of just makes it the most rounded flavor. How could you go wrong with crunchy bread, spreadable duck and sweet cherry jelly? The key elements of a pate is usually ground, it has offal, usually liver, it is seasoned with some kind of booze or alcohol, and is highly flavored in what we call the pate spices, cinnamon, clove, nutmeg. Pistachio pate. This has a very distinct look to it. On the outside, you're gonna see this marbling. That is call fat. That is the lining of the pig's stomach. We line the terrine with the inside of the belly. When it poaches, the fat renders and keeps it extra moist. So this pate is made with pork trim, pork shoulder, offal, that could be liver, kidney, pork fat, panade, which is bread and cream, shallot, cooked down in booze. Pate is traditionally served with three condiments. A little bit of whole grain mustard, a chunk of pate, and a pickle on the side. Mm. The most important thing about pate is texture. It needs to resemble meat, melt in your mouth. From a flavor perspective, it has to have the flavor of liver or offal, but you don't want it to hit you over the head with the livery flavor, and it's gotta be smooth and creamy, no graininess, no texture whatsoever. The pickle really plays as a palate cleanser, a little chunk of bright, crunchy pickle. And you're back for more pate. Here we have pork liver mousse. On top, we have a layer of lard. That's to keep the oxygen away from the pate to help preserve it. I'm gonna remove it from the terrine. I like to just kind of move it, take a knife around the outside. Underneath the fat is actually where the pork liver mousse is. Liver mousse is probably not the gateway pate if you're just getting into pate for the first time. It is definitely very awfully. What you're looking for from a quality perspective is that it is nice and smooth. It doesn't have any graininess that is on the outside and it is an even color all the way through. As you slice them, it should just be perfectly spreadable. This is one of those products that you celebrate the flavor of the liver. Pork liver, all the other livers are very irony and remind you of that liver flavor. I like to use a big crunchy bread with it. Here we have focaccia, just an amazing springy light bread, and then a bitter lemony salad to remove all of the flavor of uh, the liver out of your mouth. It is super simple. I like a little bitter uh, radicchio, a little squeeze of lemon, drizzle of olive oil, a tiny amount of salt. I think it's kind of fun to plate these directly onto the board. You can see it's really nice and smooth and easily spreadable. Then I like to drizzle each one of them with extra olive oil. And with most all livery mousses, I love a nice crunchy salt on top to give it that little bright bite. Mm. A little bitter greens. Mm. To me, this is kind of like the perfect lunch. The liver mousse is just so creamy, so delicious. A bite of iron from the liver, nice and spicy with a slight hint of wine in the background. Here we have foie gras torchon. When you say the word torchon, that is the French word for a kitchen towel. That is what we use to wrap this in when we form it. Foie gras is a fatty liver 
from either a goose or a duck. France produces about 80% of the world's foie gras as well as consumes about 80% of the world's foie gras. I like to serve my foie gras on brioche bread that has been butter and toasted. Remove the edges and then I cut them into foie gras size cuts. You're gonna try your hardest to get a really sharp knife because it's super delicate. Slice it into rounds. What you're gonna see for a high quality foie gras is that it is even and you're not seeing any specks of sinew or blood. Personally, I love a little boozy pitless cherry on top of it. Crunchy sea salt for a little salty pop. Mm. Oh my God. There is honestly nothing quite like foie gras. It is the most light and delicate liver ever made. The fruity sweetness covers up and blends so well with the little livery flavor and then the crunchy salt, absolute perfect little pop. Although we didn't go through every type of charcuterie, the cutting and serving techniques that we showed you here could be used for thousands of types of charcuterie. All you have to do now is invite some friends over and have a party. Meat maker, out, thank you.